Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to a new series. This is the uh, first of my new series and it's basically designed to uh, share a few things that are going on with you, mainly engineering things. But uh, Mr Pete has his uh, this and that series and Shop Dog Sam has his uh, fireside chat so seeing as I'm here at my roll top desk I thought I'd call this uh, Roll Top Chats. So uh, this is Roll Top Chats number one. Uh, four things to go through today. First of all I've had a parcel from uh, Poland. Uh, second of all I've got some information for a viewer on a fixture that I was asked about. Third we have a mystery item and uh, fourth I have a little uh, bit to show you on uh, steam flash hydroplanes or model steam flash hydroplanes so uh, let's zoom in and we'll start with this uh, parcel okay uh, this parcel was sent in from a, a lady who used to live in England and now lives in Poland and she restores Myford lathes for anyone that doesn't know I have a Myford ML7 as uh, you can see in some of my machining videos and it, uh, she has sent from Poland and her Myford, Myford Lathe Workshop a complete set of oilite bushes. And for anyone who doesn't know what an oilite bush is, it's a uh, sintered type of uh, bush. So sintering is a compression process where they use high force and heat to uh, compact. In this case, I believe it's bronze um, particles and oil uh, together into various shapes. Um, so that is an oil-like bush and she sent me uh, enough to re replace all these types of bushes uh, for my lathe. So uh, thank you very much. Um, she goes by the name of 68 Sweet November on YouTube and um, uh, bit by bit I will start to install these. So uh, that's very kind, thank you very much. Next on the list is a fixture and this fixture can be seen in a video uh, which I'll put a link to here where I made some split journal bearings and this fixture was for a lathe and milling operation and the idea of it was to be able to grip a part on the internal bore while I faced it and in the end milled around the periphery. Um, I'll get some drawings in a minute and we'll look at the actual internal mechanism. It's very simple but basically when I wind this allen key forwards um, a brass peg on each side springs out or is forced out and um, I had a, a message from a viewer asking for more information on how I made this fixture and if I had any drawings. So let's uh, have a look at some sketches now. So here's a close up of what I've just shown in the form of a sketch. And um, the basic form of it is a stub mandrel. We have a, a diameter here to chuck on with a shoulder to push up against and a diameter here which is a good fit in the bore. So the thing that's slightly different about this mandrel compared to a stub mandrel are these plugs drawn in blue and the screw. I haven't quite drawn them right, they should be um, 180 degrees apart going through the centre but I'll show you another drawing of the internals in a moment but when this screw is tightened into this tapped hole this tapered diameter um, presses on the end of these plugs and they uh, eject outwards squashing against what would be the uh, internal bore of your component um, because of that one of the important things about this mandrel is how good a fit you can get uh, between this diameter and the bore of the component you're holding on it uh, a, you need a good fit for the alignment and concentricity, but also uh, as these plugs are going to be pushing the part away, um, 
you really need as little slack as possible so that it, it isn't pulled off the diameter in any any way causing wobbling or uh, eccentricity so um, before I confuse you we'll have a look at another drawing so here's my other sketch I'll just point out this mechanism we've got our taper on the end of the bolt I've just shown and the only part you can't really see from the outside is the end of these plugs and if we imagine um, them in 3D they're round and on the bottom I cut an angle I can't draw a round angle um, but anyway you get the idea you've got um, a, a round plug with an angled face at the bottom and that angle should match the angle of that um, machined taper so that when this pushes inwards this goes upwards and that's happening on both sides and that is what causes the locking effect I've put some dimensions on here because I was asked for them but really you just make it whatever you've got around or whatever will do what you want it to do I had some 2 inch aluminium lying around so I chose that for my main piece um, what is important with this is the order you do it in so the first thing I did was to prepare this cap head I used M8 or 3 8 by something can't remember what and um, I picked a cap head and turned that angle while the lathe was free because it will get tied up with this um, so while the lathe was free I turned that um, then I decided what I was going to use for this arrangement here now you can either drill the holes based on what stock you've got or you can drill the hole and turn the stock based on what size hole you've got so really again it's what you've got um, I like to go for a good um, not interference fit but push fit because um, you want these to be retained so that they don't drop out when there's nothing holding them in and I'll come on to that again in a minute but once I've got this and I've prepared these and put a hole in it so we're putting a hole right through the piece of stock at the moment I then uh, set up in the lathe and I set up in the lathe and turn it down and if you're actually ready to use the fixture at this moment you can go right to finish diameter and then tap your hole or tap your hole first whatever uh, but if you're going to set this aside again until your other bits are ready for any reason I'd leave 50 thou or 100 thou on the diameter um, and the reason for this is once you put it in the chuck and turn the finished diameter you really don't want to take it out again until all the parts that are going to be on it are done uh, you can always re-skim the shoulder because you've got plenty of stock there but the diameter can only be one size obviously uh, the size of the bore of your part and so uh, that that can only be one size so that needs to be turned at um, the right moment so to summarize you can make it out of any bits and pieces you have whatever uh, will do the job but the order you make it in is important so that you don't end up needing to turn this once you've already got this in the chuck and down to diameter unless you're like Mr Pete and you have seven lathes one more thing I'll say is you have an option what to do with the top of these uh, some of these mandrels I've made have had domed tops and you can prepare those fully beforehand and just put them in the downside of that is you're then pressing a dome against the flat of your or the flatter surface of your internal bore when I say flat I mean straight obviously it'll be round but you're pressing a dome against your bore so you're getting a point contact what I did on this one was to have these as such a fit whereas uh, I could machine the finished diameter with the plugs installed so I got down leaving about um, I don't know 50 thou on I put the plugs in I put the screw in I tightened it gently and then I finished 
uh, with several passes, taking it lightly uh, down. And th by doing it that way, the plugs end up with the same radius around the end of them as on your stub mandrel, meaning that when the pad goes against your internal bore, you're getting a pad contact rather than a point contact. Anyway, enough about my stub mandrel. To follow on from that, I was given this very generously by an instructor, uh, an instructor who I learned a lot from uh, elsewhere, um, gave me this, uh, and it is a piece he made on during his apprenticeship. It's a scribing block, so you can use it on a surface table for marking out, and it, it's fully adjustable. Use it either way up, and basically you've got a, a spinning brass plug. And when you tighten this knob on the end, everything locks up. So if I release that, it'll swing to any position. When I lock it, it's totally solid. And it turns out it's actually the same mechanism as what I've just shown in many ways. If I unscrew this, you'll find that there is a point on the end and uh, I can't take it apart, but I'm assuming that um, there is some kind of plug in there that meets with that point and um, forces a peg against the external bore or uh, something to lock it all up. So, uh, just a thing I thought I'd show you. Okay, now on to the mystery item. Uh, just before Christmas I was at my grandparents' house and my granddad sent me up into the attic to dig out his Christmas decorations and while he was up there he said, oh, see if you can find a box that says lamps on it and I did and in it was this and uh, this is my mystery item I'm not going to tell you my uh, grandfather's um, profession um, as that would be a big clue but. I think this is the kind of thing where you'll either know what it is or you won't. So it'd be inter it would be interesting to see who recognises this, if anyone. I'll zoom in closer in a second, but basically this aluminium part is the thing and my granddad turned it into a lamp with a wooden base, uh, this plastic lamp connector and he's earthed it inside. But I'll zoom in and you can see if you can work out what it is. Okay. Here's a close-up. And to find out what it is, you'll have to tune into Roll Top Chats number two. Well, I'll give it a couple of weeks to see if anyone can work out what is um, what it is, and if they know what it is. So, uh, mystery item aside now, I'm going to uh, talk about these steam flash hydroplanes. I went to a talk at the Engineering Society I'm a member of uh, last night, and there was a man uh, doing the talk called um, Paul Windross, who back in the 70s achieved some world records for motorcycle sprint um, but in more recent years he's taken to building steam flash hydroplanes and here's a picture of one so basically this is a, a water uh, vehicle it travels over the water at huge speeds and it's driven by a 14cc single cylinder steam engine. So the way the vehicle gets so much power is through the superheating of the steam. In a normal um, steam engine, water comes straight off the boiler at whatever pressure the boiler's at and powers the engine. With this, the steam goes through these pipes which are being heated by a uh, jet of flame so it really produces the steam at a, a at a state where it is highly expanded <laughs> yeah. 
I'm going to preheat the burners. You see, you've got to keep the weight down. We have a weight limit. Uh, right, yeah. Can't work on me, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the pump's working. So do we. <laughs> Which way was it? Sure. <laughs> the idea. the molten lard, does it? <laughs> Ventura's. Uh, so, uh, it's getting a bit hotter than it normally does. <laughs> I, I, think the, uh, I think the water pump's not working very well. <laughs> certainly exciting to watch in real life and if you don't do anything else today do this I'll put a link here for a, uh, a video of this in action on some water he showed the uh, this video last night and I I believed it was quick but when I actually saw the video of it I was absolutely amazed so uh, go to that link and have a look at the video of it there he gets it going into about two minutes in and he's the man in the uh, whitish hat so uh, have a look at that because I think you really will be amazed um, so that's it for this roll top chat uh, if this becomes a popular video and there's interest in it I'll do more so uh, uh, let me know what you think of it and I'll wait with interest to see if anyone can guess what the mystery item is so uh, uh, thanks for watching and see you on the next video